thing that you should know about me is that I don't watch a lot of TV, unless it has to do with Cardinals baseball, you all know that, <laughs> gardening, cooking, or the one and only reality TV show that anyone should ever watch. 39 days, 18 people, yeah. one survivor. Survivor. I love Survivor. Are there any Survivor fans out here this morning? Okay, a few more than the last service. Great. I was asking around earlier this week if any of our staff watches Survivor, and a lot of them were like, no, that's dumb. I'm like, wow, I must be really weird then. Thanks, everybody. So I'm glad to see I have some, some fans out there this morning. But if you're not familiar with Survivor, it's a reality TV show on CBS where contestants live on an island together for 39 days, and there's challenges and social experiments, and they vote one another off their tribe. And at the end of the show, there's one person crowned sole survivor, and they win $1 million. And I've watched Survivor since I was probably in middle school. I started watching around when season seven aired, and during COVID, I introduced, well, I found out that my husband Jake had never seen Survivor, so of course I introduced him. And we had all kinds of time on our hands, so we rewatched every single season, and I got him hooked. And for my birthday that year, Jake got this for me. Check it out. CG, what's up? This is Tyson from Survivor, and I have a little uh, birthday song for you, and it goes like this. Happy, happy birthday, CG, dear. Happy days will come to you all year. If I had a wish, then it would be a happy, happy birthday to you. Apparently, you've been binging Survivor season since this quarantine mm -hmm. thing. Hopefully, you've been binging peanut butter as well because it's an excellent source of nutrition. CG, HBD. It's Tyson, one of my favorite players on Survivor. But I thought, like, wow, Jake, that was so nice of him to, like, do that for me. And he's like, oh, I paid for him to do that <laughs> for you. So that was... Really great. But anyways, we're big Survivor fans. How could you not watch? There are people willingly going to a stranded island with people that they don't know they've never met. That is entertainment, people. If we haven't met before, my name is C.G. Embry, and I serve as the communications pastor here at the summit. And today we're continuing in this series called Clarity in context, where we've been taking a look at some of the common verses found in Scripture that often can be taken out of context to maybe make us feel a little better about ourselves or to maybe bring us some comfort. And our goal for this series is not to call any one of us out, because we've all probably done this at some point in our lives, including me. But we're walking through some of these verses together to discover the context around them. But not only that, to gain clarity on God's word. Because it's our hope and our prayer that you would be inspired in your own discipleship journey. To want to learn and grow and gain an understanding on scripture as you follow Jesus. And this matters because in order to partake in the satisfaction and joy that only God provides... We need clarity on who God is. When I think about people leaving to go on the show Survivor, it makes me wonder what their family members might say to them on their way there. Maybe it's simply, you've got this, or break a leg, or don't tell anyone if you find a hidden immunity idol. If you all watched the show, you'd understand. <laughs> or maybe it's God won't give you more than you can handle. Does that sound familiar? Is it true? Will God not give us more than we can handle? This saying isn't actually found anywhere in Scripture, but it does often stem from a verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. God won't give you more than you can handle is blurring what Paul is getting at here. This phrase is saying that God won't allow us to go through really difficult circumstances in life. And if we took a poll this morning, I would guess that many of you would say that you've gone through something really difficult in your lifetime. And if you haven't yet, you're probably going to at some point, right? 
So I think it's important that we clarify this morning, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, life is going to be hard sometimes. And being a follower of Jesus doesn't exclude us from the difficulties of the broken world that we live in. So what did Paul actually mean? We have to zoom out and focus in because there's clarity in the context. We can head back to the surrounding text to see what we can find. Many times at the beginning of the chapters of the Bible, there's a quick little summary or a title about what we're going to read. Today I have my handy study Bible here. It's an NIV cultural study Bible. And there's a link to this Bible on our website, the summit.church slash context. And there's some other resources available for you there too. But a study Bible is a great place to start when we're looking for context. And it differs from a regular Bible because it includes cultural summaries before each book, as well as footnotes and maps and timelines and all kinds of information that is helpful when we're looking for context. So here on the screen, you can see an introduction of the book of 1 Corinthians. It tells us what it's even about, who wrote it, the main theme of the book. And what we know about 1 Corinthians is that it's a letter to the church in Corinth written from the apostle Paul to the followers followers of Jesus in Corinth. And Paul is addressing the divisions taking place in the church from spiritual immaturity, problems that were arising. And this information is taken just from taking a look at the introduction in our study Bible. But it's a simple way that we can begin to understand the context and find clarity about what's happening in this time period. And above chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, it says, warnings from Israel's history. So from this title alone, we know that Paul is about to give a warning about something. So the clarity in the context here is Paul is giving a warning to the church members in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5, Paul actually starts giving this warning. And he recalls what's happened in Israel's past. And he warns the church in Corinth to not be ignorant of their actions. So when we put the header together and the verses of this chapter, it informs us that Paul is referring to the Old Testament account of Israel's history, more specifically the Exodus. And in our handy study Bible in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, we see a footnote that references where in Exodus that this happens. And verse 4 says, And they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. If you were to just read that, you're like, I have a lot of questions. Who is Paul talking about? A spiritual drink? Water from a rock? These are all super great questions. We should not be afraid to ask questions when we're reading scripture because it means we're looking for answers, right? So to find some answers, we need to zoom all the way back to the book of Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible to find some clarity. If you're not familiar with the Exodus story, the Israelites have been in slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh's ruling. And eventually, after a series of plagues, the Pharaoh frees the Israelites, and they're on their way out of Egypt. And he changes his mind and sends an army after them. This is where we see Moses parting the Red Sea, and the Israelites flee into the wilderness. No home, no food, no water. It was kind of like a season of Survivor, just a lot longer than 39 days. But the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, not just physically, but spiritually away from God. But what we discover is that God keeps his promises. We fast forward to Exodus 16 and 17. We read the account of the Israelites complaining and grumbling over and over again about not having food. And their leader, Moses, cries out to God saying, they're about ready to stone me if you don't do something. And the Lord reminds Moses of his promises to provide meat at twilight, manna in the morning, and water from a rock. 
But the Israelites get so caught up in what's going wrong, despite these good, good gifts that the Lord has been providing to them day in and day out. So they partake in this goodness, and they immediately go and give into temptation and turn away from God. So the clarity in the context number two is Paul is reminding the church in Corinth of the history and the shortcomings of the Israelites. And Paul continues his warning in the verses to follow and continues to reference the Exodus. In verse 6, he says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And then he goes on to list examples like, Do not be idolaters. Do not commit sexual immortality. Do not test Christ. Do not grumble. And as we discovered a little bit earlier, the people who are making up the church in Corinth are kind of all over the place, right? From divisions in the church between the classes to hanging on to pagan beliefs, sexual immortality. Paul has a lot to address here. And it's really common for the writers of the New Testament to call back to the count of the Old Testament. Because the church in Corinth at this time would have been very familiar with the Exodus story and all the details about it. So for Paul to remind them of this story was likely very convicting for them. Think about it this way. How many of you eat Oreos? Anyone? Okay, some of you eat Oreos. I like Oreos. But the real debate is which is better, chocolate or golden? I hear a lot of chocolate out here. I believe with my whole heart that chocolate Oreos are the best Oreo. Okay. And Jake, my husband, believes that golden Oreos are the right Oreo. There's already been people texting him about this. It's insulting to me that he thinks golden Oreos are better. But in reality, they're both a delicious cookie, right? Like you're not going to turn down a golden Oreo if there's not a chocolate one available. You know what I'm saying? So Paul comparing the Corinthian sinful behavior to that of the Israelites was absolutely insulting to them. In their mind, there's no way they're as bad as the Israelites. It can't be. But in reality, they're both disobedient to God. So this is what Paul is getting at. He's saying, you Corinthians are acting no better than your ancestors. And remember what happened to them. God was displeased. So the clarity in the context number three is both the Israelites and the Corinthians faced temptation. In verse 11, Paul continues. He says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. On whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Can you imagine this with me? Instead of Paul warning the church in Corinth about temptation and sin and the dangers of it, if he had just said, it's okay, God won't give you more than you can handle. No, that's way too vague and unrealistic for the church members in Corinth. They needed these warnings about Israel's past to be inspired to stand firm against temptation I feel like this letter from Paul could just be read aloud today and preached right to us. Paul warns the temptations that the Israelites faced are happening too in Corinth. And the temptations that are happening in Corinth are happening in our modern world too. The vehicle in which we experience temptation just might look a little bit different. But we are often still tempted. We often still fall short. The clarity in the context number four is Paul's warning is for us too. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Clarity in the context number five is Our God is faithful and provides a way out. 
Paul isn't writing about not giving us more than we can handle. It's a warning about sin and encouragement to stand firm through the temptations. And I think we need to clarify the difference between the two this morning. Temptation is just that. The definition is the desire to do something wrong or unwise. And sin is acting upon the temptation. The definition is this, a corrupt state of human nature in which the self is estranged from God. If it's okay with you, I'm going to use another Oreo example. Um, you're going to want to just stop by the store on your way home, hy V grab a couple packs of Oreos and watch Survivor all afternoon. That sounds like a great Sunday, right? I'm sorry in advance, but... When I was in college, I, uh, my freshman year, I had a potluck roommate, right, roommate at random, and her name was Molly. In my first semester, I had a brand new pack of Oreos in our dorm room, and I left, and my roommate Molly ate like half or more of the entire package while I was gone, and she knew I was going to come back and ask if she had eaten any, and she could have thought of and crafted a lie so that I wouldn't have been mad at her. This would be a temptation to lie. Now, if Molly had lied and said, no, our friend Kaylee came by and she ate them all, that would have been acting upon the temptation to lie and sin. But Molly didn't lie. She owned up to eating all of them and withstood the temptation. And to this, t- to this day, I'm happy to let you know that Molly and I are still friends. This did not damage our friendship at all. But what is, it, what is it for you? Sometimes I think we immediately think about the big temptations, right? To murder, steal, commit adultery, etc. But it's the lesser sins that our culture approves of that put distance between us and God. Things like gossiping, jealousy, greed, impatience desire to fit in, to do anything to be successful, the white lies, laziness, the list goes on and on. It's the small things that tempt us that might make us feel good. For even a period of time, leave us with some sort of satisfaction that will soon fade. I've heard it said before that our culture is a whatever-it-takes culture, No matter what it takes to fulfill the desire that we have to make us feel good, we'll multiply sin to do it. And that breaks my heart because I believe that God offers so much more to us because the things of this world will not satisfy. And if you're someone who's here today and maybe it's your first time or you've never been to church before, or maybe you're someone who's struggling with some shortcomings in your own life, My hope and my prayer is that you would know this and hear this. God's grace has already gone before you. He knows you, he loves you, and he wants you near, not far. This is why he gives us guardrails and guidelines to live by. He has our best interest in mind. And some good news. Temptation gives us an opportunity to be faithful to God. I love how James says it here. James 1 verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Temptation gives us an opportunity to be faithful to God. Will you consider it pure joy when you face trials? And how? Paul gives the answer in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. How do we do that? We have to be realistic. Following Jesus doesn't mean that life is automatically made easy. In reality, Christians will struggle with temptation. 
This quote from N.T. Wright sums it up nicely. It says this, In other words, you must not presume that because you are baptized Christians, sharing in the community life where the Spirit is known and present, and eating and drinking the bread and wine of the Eucharist, you have automatically reached a level that requires no more for further moral effort or restraint. Christian sacraments are not magic. They don't automatically make you holy in all other aspect, respects. They don't automatically bring you salvation. Following Jesus well will require some on our part. But thankfully, we can go knowing that Jesus shared in the temptation of this world. He spent 40 days being tempted in the wilderness leading up to his crucifixion. Jesus is able to emphasize with us. He gets the struggle because he knew it too. Next thing is we need to be ready to confidently face temptation and avoid sin. We have to be ready. We need to be ready by being in God's word to find clarity on how to stand firm against temptation. It's there where we find the guardrails for living how God intends. We need to rely on the power of prayer. It's there we find God's wisdom and direction when we don't know what to do. We need to lean into strength that comes from being in community with other believers. It's there we find that we're not alone. And if you don't have a group of friends that you can trust and will warn you in the ways that Paul warns the church in Corinth, maybe you need to reconsider those who you are spending the most time with. I have this text group with a couple of our friends called Surviving Fill in the Blank. It started in 2020 with Surviving COVID and has changed from time to time depending on what's going on in the world or in our lives or what we're facing. And it's a place where we're honest with each other, to encourage each other, a space where we can be real. And it's a small community that's for one another. Do you have that? Last thing is to be encouraged because God promises to be with us and to provide. The Israelites were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and God was with them, and he provided every step along the way. And eventually God shows mercy, and he delivers them into the promised land, and he dwells among his people in the tabernacle. Despite the shortcomings of the Corinthians, God was still with them and used them. The believers in Corinth were given the Holy Spirit to guide and direct and correct. And the church continued to grow and spread. And that same Holy Spirit is provided to us today. So when life feels like it's more than you can handle and you just want to give in, remember that God is with you. Paul reminds us that he will literally provide a way out of the temptation if we are looking for it. Temptation gives us an opportunity to be faithful to God, just as Jesus was faithful, faithful to the point of death. And when we do fall short, because we will, God has provided the ultimate way out of sin through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, his sinless life, death, and resurrection. So earlier, we talked about the show Survivor, and there's a lot of opportunities for contestants on the show to give in to temptation, to lie, cheat, steal, de- deceit. There's something that happened on a more recent season to Tyson, my favorite player. Contestants could earn fire tokens, which was just like a form of currency in the game, and they could use them to purchase advantages that would help them or to hurt other players' games. And Tyson made a choice to use his fire tokens to buy an entire jar of peanut butter to eat all by himself, to give him nutrients, to be stronger in the challenges and the game. Isn't that so funny? Did you already play it? He looks so satisfied, don't you think? Just eating a jar of peanut butter. He like hid by himself to eat this jar of peanut butter. And I thought this was absolutely hilarious And as I was thinking about today's message, I was reminded about how God promises to satisfy when we are faithful to him. I think about the Israelites partaking in the manna from heaven and the water from a rock. And it reminds me, and it's a lot like Tyson partaking in his peanut butter, right? 
It was good and satisfying in this moment of weakness. Today we're going to do something just a little bit different. This story reminds me of one of the Psalms. And as we read it together, I want to invite you to stand up as I read this psalm over you. So you can go ahead and stand this morning. And after we read it together, I want to invite you to reflect on the words of this next song. Psalm 81, starting in verse 10, says this. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. If my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes, and you would be fed with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I will satisfy you. Let's take a moment to respond to this promise of God together.